Welcome to Electrified, it's your host Dylan Loomis. A very happy Friday to all of you and a quick shout out to my newest patrons, Anna and Jess, Scott, Kelly, Jerry, Cody, Brian, RT, Steve, Eric, Jeff, and Yvonne, or Ivan. Thank you all very much for the support. And a quick note to all of the electrical engineers that did reach out to me via email. Thank you guys for doing that. I greatly appreciate it. We have been overwhelmed with inquiries. So I'm going to speak to my business partner about how we want to proceed. And I will be in touch either via email or with updates on the channel in the coming days. So stay tuned. First up, let's take a look at this chart from Piper Sandler's Alex Potter. It's just a visual representation of different models, the months since initial launch, and then the cumulative number of units sold since the launch. As you can see, the Model 3 leads the way. The Model Y is then right ahead of it in terms of the time frame to meet certain delivery milestones. But what I want to point out here is even the third place vehicle, the Volkswagen ID3, it took them roughly 21 months to reach 100,000 units sold. It took the Model 3 about 16 to 17 months, and it's only taken the Model Y 12 to 13 months. And then if you take a second to think what Tesla's $25,000 vehicle might look like, it would look something like zing. But the point being here is some of the biggest competition and they're really not even in the same ballpark. Next up, this one was new to me. There is a Cybertruck graffiti trucker hat available on the Tesla shop website for $35 in black or white. Link below if you wanna check it out. Next up, some exciting news from Elon. He's thinking of starting a new university, the Texas Institute of Technology and Science. Some are referring to as but Elon said it will have epic merch, it will be universally admired, SMR asked, funding secured, and Elon said, of. And in case you're not familiar, Elon has already endeavored into the education system, basically starting his own school initially for his kids, saying, I just didn't see regular schools, they weren't doing the things I thought should be done. I thought, let's see what we can do. Maybe creating a school would be better. Back in 2014, Elon asked Josh Don, not Jeff Don, a former Teach for All fellow and his kid's teacher at the time, if he'd start a better school with him at SpaceX. Don agreed. Then the school Ad Astro was born, where they batch children by ability instead of age, which I think is pretty clearly a good idea. And you don't teach so much the tools, but rather you teach the problems. It's more of a hands-on simulation-based education. They have since spun off Synthesis, which is a simulation based learning experience built around complex team games. Students work through case studies, simulations, and game-based challenges. So who knows if TITS will ever come to fruition, but if it's anything like his previous foray into education, it could be a pretty cool option. Next up, some news from Temp on Twitter. The refreshed Model X long range will be lighter and more powerful. Compared to the 2020 version, the newer version will have a 14% reduction in battery weight, 13% increase in battery specific energy, a power increase of more than 30%, equipped AC magnetic motors both front and rear, and a 4% reduction in curve weight. Now some of you may have heard this as curb, C-U-R-B weight. It's essentially just the weight of the vehicle with nothing in it. And this info is coming from documents filed to the EPA. But I wanted to share this because there's a decent amount of people saying the refreshed Model X isn't that differentiated from the previous version. But as you can see, part of it is because the actual changes, some of them at least, are not really visible. Next up, we have an awesome video from Desmond on Twitter sharing the new Tesla Sentry Mode feature, specifically the voice speaker function, and it actually changes your voice. Check it out. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Step away. Step away. Pretty cool. Great feature. I love it. So you can bet there's going to be some very interesting videos of using this feature coming out in the coming months. Now, I wanted to take a quick moment to give an update on Waymo. We haven't touched on this lately, so they've been operating in the Phoenix Chandler area for some time and, you know, giving the driverless rides. There's plenty of videos on YouTube, but now they are testing in San Francisco, but what I'm getting at is their rollout has been very slow. You would think if things were going well financially in the Phoenix area, they would be ramping and scaling quickly, investing more money, but things have seemingly stalled. And yes, testing in San Francisco, as you can see from this video, is very challenging. There's plenty of 
bicyclists, walkers, and unusual situations that's going to make it very tough for a company like Waymo that focuses on HD maps and gathering all of that data in that way. Which by the way, toward the end of the episode, we're gonna talk briefly about how the entire industry has gone one route with these HD maps and Tesla is one of the only companies that has not and there's some important things I wanna highlight. So just quickly as a refresher, Waymo stopped selling their LiDAR vehicles commercially to other companies. Now their primary business models are Waymo One, which is the driverless rides, and then Waymo Via, which is that in a commercial setting with trucks. As mentioned, they're only operating commercially in the Phoenix area with a limited fleet, and now they are doing testing in San Francisco with some initial passengers, but they're only approved, basically beta testers that get free rides in exchange for feedback on the rides. So just to get it out there, is Waymo dead? What I'm thinking is, okay, maybe the Phoenix model wasn't working because it wasn't dense enough. There's not enough demand to cover all of the overhead and costs that Waymo has, so they go to a more dense market like San Francisco, but the problem is then it's a much more challenging market with people and all of those factors. Because look, if Waymo is doing well in the Phoenix market, you would think that they would go to another market just like Phoenix with easier driving conditions if the financials made sense. And in case you missed it, the former Waymo CEO left the company in April 2021. Several other execs have also left in recent months. Tim Willis, former GM of Waymo's LiDAR business, also left in February to join a competing LiDAR company. So other than the obvious hardware, the LiDAR and everything adding to the cost for Waymo, they also have a call center to respond when a customer pushes a button inside the car for help. And it's also been reported that a lot of the Waymos out and about giving rides are frequently tailed by a Waymo roadside assistance van. If a Pacifica gets stuck, a van can quickly arrive at the scene to fix the problem. But again, it's more of the business model. In Phoenix, there's plenty of parking, the streets are open, a lot of people have cars. So is this really a useful service in an area like that? I think that is up for debate. And one of the most common reasons people in the suburbs take taxis is to get to the airport. Phoenix's main airport is 10 miles northwest of Waymo's current service territory. So like I said, just a quick update on Waymo. We haven't talked about them recently. Next up, a quick note here about the potential new EV proposal that I think is going overlooked. Listen to this. Unlike the existing EV tax credit, which requires EV buyers to claim it on their taxes at the end of the year and can only be fully used if your tax burden is at least $7,500. What that means is let's say you owe 10,000 in taxes and you get the full 7,500 rebate, that would bump your tax bill down to $2,500. But if you owed $5,000 in taxes and you got the full $7,500 credit, you would only receive a $5,000 benefit because it will only bump your tax bill down to zero it cannot put you in the positive, meaning you would not get a check for the remainder of that amount. Now with this new proposal, you would actually get the benefit of the EV tax credit at the time you take delivery rather than having to wait until tax time, which would indeed actually help the middle class more. So still a lot of detail to be worked out, but I thought that was an important point. And Elon basically confirmed what I was talking about in yesterday's episode about how GM, Chrysler, Ford were essentially bailed out. A lot of that money was never paid back. And he just goes on to say that Tesla always pays its debts and they actually pay theirs with interest. US taxpayers actually profited from the Tesla loan. Once again, exactly what we talked about yesterday. A nice tweet from Jim Farley here. Elon said the cemetery of automotive startups over the past century is large and will get larger. Tesla and Ford, the only American car companies that haven't gone bankrupt. Jim says thanks for leading the way. And you guys know I love these public tip of the caps, giving credit where it is due. Next up, a quick excerpt from Dan Ives about Tesla to two trillion, which once again, we just talked about over on Patreon, when that might be a realistic possibility. Check it out if you're interested, but take a listen to what Dan said. It's the margin story starting to take hold. That's the difference yes. in the story. And it comes down to the haters will hate. They hated it at 100 bucks. They'll hate it split adjusted at 5,000. But those are the same people. If they were NFL scouts, they were probably negative on Tom Brady in the 2000 draft. <laughs> good. That's a good analogy. So where do you think it, what's your bull case now? Because your new price target's 1100. We're, I saw it at 1094. So we're there. What's your new bull case? Well, bull case is 1500. And I believe 1500. It's, it's 1500. I think this is just a march to eventually when we look out the next you know, 18, 24 months, there's no reason this can't go to a $2 trillion mark cap, just given what we're seeing in EV demand. And, and it speaks to our thesis, this is a fourth industrial revolution that's playing out in front of us. 
and Tesla, obviously, you know, on, on EVs now, I think just more taking notice as to what's happening, and it's real because now you're starting to see it show up in the numbers. All right, so here we have it. Toyota is coming out of the woodwork with its first all-electric car, the BZ4X, BZ4 Beyond Zero. This is basically a new sub-brand. They plan to have seven plus different EV vehicles over the coming years. So this was announced a few months ago, but now we get the actual production version along with some more detail. This will be for the Japanese market first, hopefully the US market later next year. The exterior looks pretty good. It's a pretty strong, aggressive looking vehicle. I don't mind it. Don't know if I love it. I'm gonna need to take some time. But some quick specs, it'll have a 71 kilowatt hour battery pack. In terms of range, it'll most likely fall in the mid 200s when it comes to the EPA scale, but we won't get that data for some time. It should have DC fast charging up to 150 kilowatts. It is capable of bi-directional charging for vehicle to home capacity, and it's reportedly going to be offered with an optional solar roof capable of 1800 kilometers of driving distance per year or roughly 1100 miles. And what do you know? It looks like Toyota has designed an optional yoke of its own, but this one is indeed going to be different than Tesla's. This is going for one motion grip, so the lock to lock is set around 150 degrees, eliminating the need to change grips when steering. Essentially, the turning radius will be smaller. The difference is that the BZ4X's is connected to a steer by wire system that has no mechanical connection to the wheels and is programmed so that the yoke only needs to turn up to 150 degrees from side to side and the driver doesn't ever need to remove their hands. Now there is no pricing available as of now, but what do you guys think? I think it's a decent looking vehicle. As expected, I think the specs are just going to be middling. They're not going to push or challenge Tesla, but I don't think anybody was expecting that. But if it's Toyota, this might not be a terrible first move into the BEV space. Next up, we get some battery news for Tesla in China. This comes from 36KR, a Chinese source. This was who reported it first, saying Tesla has booked 45 gigawatt hour lithium iron phosphate LFP batteries from China's leading power battery company, Ningdi Times, for next year's sales plan, mainly for Model 3 and Y vehicles. Size of the deal, 45 gigawatt hours of battery orders, which should correspond to around 800,000 cars if we are assuming a rough 56 kilowatt hour pack size per car. And this isn't necessarily news here, but the source said Tesla will sell at least 1.5 million cars in 2022. And the word on the street is this deal is going to be for Tesla in China. And as mentioned, I want to take a second to speak briefly about this HD maps LiDAR situation, because remember, basically the entire rest of the industry is taking this approach toward trying to solve autonomy which I think there are some big limitations and standardization issues that people don't really talk about. Then you have Tesla doing the vision only approach. Yes, they rely on maps to some degree, but not the HD maps that these other companies use. Elon has said, we briefly barked up the tree of high precision lane line maps, but decided it was not a good idea. And just so you guys know, there are different levels and tiers of maps. It basically comes down to the amount of information and the precision of that information. So if somebody says HD maps, that's basically talking about LiDAR and the most specific type of map. Of course, one of the biggest questions is the cost and scalability of keeping these maps up to date. As you know, in the real world, things change a lot. You have road construction and other factors that you constantly need to be updating for. Is the data a lot? There are people on both sides of the argument, but let's continue. Elon also said high precision maps and lanes are a really bad idea. Any change and it can't adapt. But something that I think also goes overlooked, most though not all road changes are actually planned in advance and published in a database where companies can put them into their maps so they're not necessarily a surprise. Once again, it would just come down to the manpower and the actual implementation of uploading these updates to make sure they're constantly up to date. But look, this HD map market is crucial for everyone else not named Tesla because they actually rely on these maps to make their driving decisions where Tesla is relying on their camera suite. And yes, as mentioned, they use some level of maps, but it's to a much lesser degree. And look, I do not want to get too far into the weeds here, but just listen to some of this while you watch some Waymo and other map-based companies. So the HD map market for autonomous vehicles by value is around $1.4 billion this year, projected to reach $16.9 billion by 2030. These HD maps are built and updated in real time by using data captured by various sensors, cameras, and LiDAR. 
Now, the advantages of in-house HD mapping are control over the maintenance strategy, adding features and info according to the requirement, maintaining accuracy, and being cost-effective. North America is actually estimated to be the largest market for HD maps for autonomous vehicles during the forecast period, which is 2021 to 2030. But here's the key of what I wanted to highlight. The standardization of these HD maps is a crucial element in the development of HD maps technology. At present, there is no single authoritative source or database of HD mapping data. The standardization and storage of this data has emerged as a major concern. Essentially, there is no central database of all of this map data being gathered by all of these different companies. Even if there was, it would lack interoperability between the mapping suppliers. This lack of a single automotive grade navigation base is one of the crucial obstacles to the full commercial readiness and safety of self-driving cars, amongst others. So what we have here is all of these different companies pursuing autonomy, publishing their own maps in their own proprietary formats, but the real value of HD mapping can only be realized through standardization. So I just wanted to highlight the potential issue of the lack of standardization of these HD maps that all these other companies are working on in a fragmented fashion. And then you have Tesla doing their own thing with vision. So I wouldn't be surprised at least in the next few years if all of these other autonomous companies are stuck to certain cities, big cities, where there's going to be enough demand for rides where you have pre-planned routes and you can't really go outside of the city. You can't go on road trips, take trips in an autonomous fashion. The only company that it looks like can solve that anytime in the near future will be Tesla. But it's Friday, so here we have it. Just a very quick look at Tesla stock for the week and one other thing I wanted to point out. So this yellow line is Monday, the first day of the week. So if we go back to the close on Friday to where we are at today, Tesla stock up about 20% or $183. Or if we just go from Monday morning to where we're at now, we're still up about 15% or $143. And apologies, but I am going to keep the analysis of Tesla stock on Patreon for now because we are going to do the giveaway for hitting that first goal for all the patrons that are over there by the end of the weekend. But that is all for today. Please take a second to like the video if you did. Hope you guys have a wonderful and safe weekend and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.